Come on in, guys. Welcome to Idled Out, where we talk all things Survivor. My name is Luke, and today we're talking about Survivor's worst voting track records ever. Yes, sometimes in Survivor, you're just not on the side of the numbers. It happens. No one bats a thousand. But these six players were, well, rarely on the side of the numbers at all. In fact, they might not even know what numbers are. So we'll be going through their games and examining how they bungled so many votes along the way. To judge the worst voting records of all time, we're going full brute force here, calculating it as the most times in a single season a player did not vote for the person going home, so that our worst voting record tally isn't a 40-way tie between 40 first boots. So this will skew, obviously, towards players that attended a lot of tribal councils and cast a lot of votes that didn't amount to a whole lot. In the case of ties, the player with the worst percentage of correct votes will be ranked higher, and will only be taking into account initial votes, not re-votes. I'd also like to give a shout out to two players with terrible vote records that just barely missed the cut. The first being Ozzy in South Pacific, who despite being voted out three times in one season, somehow still voted with the majority more than these people. I'd also like to give a special shout out to Jervis and Borneo, who voted for BB as Pagong's first boot in episode two, then didn't vote correctly until he voted out Laura Moret on day 13 of Blood vs. Water, some 13 years later. Finally, split votes are a thing, and you can be on the right side of the numbers and still technically vote incorrectly, complicating things to an irritating amount. I will be taking them into account, so if you were in the majority but voted for person A to flush an idol instead of person B who went home, I won't be holding it against you. That all said, let's dig into Survivor's six worst voting records ever. At number six is Michelle in Survivor Winners at War, who voted incorrectly seven times and attended 14 tribal councils. I guess Michelle was making up for lost time on her first season, where she didn't attend tribal council at all pre-merge, because this go-round, Michelle attended and survived all but four of the season's tribal councils. I'd like to say things started out well for Michelle, but they did not. Right out of the gate, Michelle's blindsided when Natalie is voted out first, with only herself and Jeremy voting alongside her. However, she briefly gets a bit of momentum when Danny nukes her own game from orbit for no reason, and then again when she and Jeremy find themselves swing votes between the new schoolers and the old schoolers. Michelle makes the most of a very awkward swap tribe, as Survivor goes full X on the beach here, stranding Michelle with her ex Wendell, Yule with his former hot tub buddy Parvati, and Nick with his high school crush. Michelle plays this swap as well as she could, voting against Wendell when Parvati goes but getting Parvati's fire tokens, then forming a strong three-person alliance with Nick and Wendell to take out Yule. At the merge, however, Wendell's blindsided, and then Michelle and Nick are left out of nearly every subsequent vote. While Nick eventually found an in at Tony's side, Michelle had no such luck, getting left out of the Kim vote, Jeremy vote, Nick vote, and only voting for Tyson because she had no other option since, you know, Jeremy pieced out. When Natalie came back in the game, they were on the outside of a strong four-way alliance, but a clutch immunity win, mini advantage get in, and Ben throwing in the towel here got her to the final three. A solid feat considering she was playing from the bottom for basically the entire second half of the game. Michelle may not have been great this season at staying in the know or finding her footing, but she was great at accruing fire tokens. Michelle at several points in the game has a king's ransom in tokens, getting tokens from many players when they're voted out, regularly cashing them in for those sweet, sweet advantages. Making the finals despite being on the outside for most of the game is an impressive feat. And personally, I would have liked to have seen Michelle get second place over Miss Johnny come lately. I think she unfortunately put way too much stock in how much those fire tokens would pay off. Working towards gaining survivor currency seems like a good strategy for a player on the bottom to focus on, if only they amounted to anything. At number 5 is Brett in Survivor Millennials vs Gen X, who voted incorrectly 7 times and attended 13 tribal councils. 
Brett started his game on the Gen X tribe and quickly formed what would prove to be a critical alliance with Chris and Sunday, putting this three-way alliance at the center of the tribe. After an easy vote out of Rachel, the rest of Brett's pre-merge is a series of blindsides at tribal, first when the Gen X women align to vote out Paul for a minor slip of the tongue, then when David plays an idol on Jessica, then in episode 7 when he's blindsided that he's not eliminated at post-swap Ikabula. At the merge, Brett reconvenes with his old buddies Chris and Sunday for another round of easy millennial votes in Michelle and Taylor. Emboldened by their game successes, Chris and Brett decide to get some good old fashioned survivor payback against Jessica for leading the charge on voting out Paul. But David and Jess mount a counterinsurgency and Chris gets sent to the jury. Following that, we get the great Millennials vs Gen X Civil War, the long-awaited strategic showdown between Zeke and David that's been percolating since earlier this episode. At Final 10, Zeke and David draft their armies for this rumble in the jungle, with Brett and his allies Sunday, Jay, and Will siding with Zeke. A deadlocked 5-5 results in Survivor's third ever rock draw, where Jess gets sent home by random chance. With this 5-sum, Brett's finally back in the driver's seat, with a solid alliance that can march towards the endgame. I didn't come here to be dragged as a goat. I came here to play. So we're going for the seat. All right, I love it. Oh, yeah, I love it. Uh, Will, my God, what are you doing? After a brief detour by everyone to punish Will and send him to bed without any milk, it's back to the bottom for Brett, as Sunday, Jay, and then himself are taken out one by one by one by David's majority alliance. Brett is a naturally gifted social player, getting by on his charisma and general likability, with a willingness to show his vulnerable side to those who spend the time getting to know him. However, following Will's blowing up of their alliance, he simply couldn't gain any traction in the back half of the game. He did, however, get really drunk. A decent consolation prize. Cheers! Keep these coming till I drop, will you? Yeah. <laughs> At number four is Aubrey in Survivor Game Changers, who also voted incorrectly at seven of her 13 tribal councils. Aubrey came into Game Changers with one of the biggest targets on her back of anyone this season. So right off the bat, I wanna say, I think she deserves credit for making it to final five, despite said target. Yes, these were the halcyon days of the Michelle v. Aubrey debates. Now, believe it or not, it's possible to appreciate both Michelle and Aubrey's games, but Game Changers Aubrey was a marked woman from day one because many thought the Korong jury simply got it wrong. Aubrey starts Game Changers strong enough, voting with the mana majority to eliminate Sierra, but it's just the second round where her game stumbles and honestly never recovers. Given Game Changers' casting divide of 10 legitimate Survivor Legends and 10 players picked from Brant Steele's randomized cast button, the big names needed to stick together, lest the literal who's literally decimate them. But Tony and Sandra simply cannot coexist on this island together, and the Big Threats Alliance is born, lives, and dies in an afternoon. With Tony gone in round two, Aubrey's adrift on her own basically the rest of the game, as the football gets pulled out from under her at every turn. She has the numbers at the Joint Tribal Council, Malcolm goes home to an idle play. She aligns with JT at the swap, Sandra sends JT home. She really can only lay claim to one elimination, Debbie's, in which she convinces Sarah to flip on Debbie because she's so stable. It's frickin' nauseating, frustrating, and I'm pissed! Once Aubrey loses her closest ally, Andrea, she's basically shut out strategically and forced to rely on Ty as her lifeline in the game. Seriously though, is there anything in Survivor Aubrey loves more than Ty? Coleslaw is really great. The coleslaw. Oh, it's coleslaw. Coleslaw? Okay, sorry Ty, you're actually second. At number three is Jay in Survivor Millennials vs Gen X, who voted incorrectly seven times but attended ten tribal councils. Jay is the yin to Brett's yang, having pretty similar game trajectories despite their generational divide. Like when Jay texts the word you, he just sends the letter U, you know, because he's a millennial. And when Brett texts the word you, he's not able to because he's using a rotary phone because he's a Gen Xer. Jay starts out on the Millennial Tribe and aligns quickly with Taylor and Figgy, calling themselves the Triforce, who then all bring in Michelle as their fourth. 
And then I got Namaste, which is her name is Michelle. Like, I know we're cool. She's a freaking hot girl too, by the way. Super hot. Wow, the application process for this alliance is so discerning. Jay's strategic game peaks very early, like episode two early. But credit where credit's due, the blind side against Mari is pitch perfect. Jay then doesn't attend Tribal Council until the last round before the merge, where he blindsides Michaela for, I've said it before and I'll say it again, literally no reason. Did you do that? Yeah. I did it. Sorry. I did not do Sorry. that. After his own alliance is blindsided at the merge and Michelle sent packing, Jay's forced to vote out his closest ally, Taylor, at the final 12. This is the last time he will vote correctly the entire game. As the last remaining member of the uh, Triforce Alliance, Jay is basically persona non grata on the tribe, rarely clued in to what's going on, but somehow always squeaking by as the bigger fish all fry each other. Still, you'd think he'd just accidentally vote correctly at some point, right? Jay's social game is quite solid. He and Adam develop this unique friendship slash rivalry, which we'll call a friend rivalry. I'm still workshopping the title. From the get-go, they've been on opposite sides of the vote, literally only voting together one time. And yet, a mutual admiration forms between the two, despite their constant targeting of one another. By the final six, Jay's the biggest threat in the game, so David makes a fake idol for Jay to find to keep him off the scent of any real idols that might be floating around out there. It works! Jay's eliminated at final six after confidently playing this fake idol. With the dissolution of his alliance at the merge, Jay simply could not get any traction in the game floating along vote to vote, never unsure if it was his time to go, and forced to rely on context clues at Tribal Council to know when to play his immunity idol. In true millennial fashion, he sarcastically wipes away a tear as he's eliminated, before walking off to, presumably, destroy chain restaurants and polish his participation trophies. At number two is Keith and Survivor Cambodia, who voted incorrectly seven of his nine Tribal Councils. Keith's Cambodia vote tally is made all the more impressive by the fact that he did not attend Tribal Council pre-merge even once, and made even more impressive by the fact that he was in the majority alliance for most of the post-merge. I mean, only Keith could be so out of the loop while simultaneously being so close to the majority alliance, yet still be the prevailing jury favorite to win. We'll just fast forward to the post-merge, where Keith found himself caught between the larger Bion Alliance, of which he was pretty much already a member, and the smaller Witch's Coven Alliance. Keith's first vote of the game is one of his only correct ones, as he joins the Bion group to vote out Cass at the merge. However, once Bion begins to cannibalize itself, Keith's left out of basically every vote, although it wasn't for lack of trying on his alliance's part. It's Keith's irritating of Tasha that sees him nudged out of the larger Bion Alliance, first over voting for her at final eight, then at final seven when he literally cannot remember her name. Uh, I can't even think of her name anymore. Tasha. Keith, you just voted for her. Keith ends up getting voted out in fifth place as an obvious threat to Jeremy, Spencer, and Tasha's final three, and you can see how upset the jury is to see Keith go out here. It's a testament to his insanely good social game that he stumbled backwards to the end game in two seasons and was a challenge or two away from winning the entire game both times, despite basically having no agency ever. If only that final five immunity challenge involved balls in some way, the man knows his way around balls. What else can I do? I'm okay. sitting here balls okay. to the wall. The most hapless, out-of-the-loop player in Survivor history is Eddie in Survivor Karamoan, who attended 11 tribal councils and voted incorrectly at 9 of them. That is a 17% success rate, folks. I want to be generous to Eddie, though, so let's discuss his two major wins in the game his two correct votes. The first came pre-merge in episode four as the fans tribe was perhaps at their lowest point, with alliances split two ways between the Cool Kids Alliance, which now only consists of Eddie and Reynold, and the 
Not as cool kids alliance. Consisting of everyone else, things seem pretty hopeless for Eddie and Reynold. Their saving grace is that they are basically the only decent challenge competitors on this tribe, meaning they're this tribe's only hope of turning the ship around. So Sherry, Michael, Julia, and Matt begrudgingly vote out Laura, their weakest physical player. Eddie then votes correctly again when his three-man alliance, the three amigos, have two immunity idols and an immunity necklace, ensuring this trio's safety for one round at the final 10, where they idle out Philip. That's it! That is the grand total of Eddie's game successes. Malcolm and Reynolds soon follow Philip out the door, as the majority alliance leaves the least threatening amigo, Eddie, for last. But what follows is classic majority alliance behavior. They begin picking off their own before fully defeating the minority alliance, leaving Eddie to just fumble around in the dark, voting blindly for whoever he looked at last. He often thought the target was him, only to be pleasantly surprised at tribal when, no, Andrea or Brenda were sent home instead. Eddie somehow finds himself in the final four following Eric's medevac at final five, meaning he was suddenly a single challenge win away from a seat at the final three and an honest to God shot of winning against Don and Sherry. Unfortunately for all of us, Eddie goes out in fourth as Cochran wins immunity. Still, I love the hyping of Eddie they do at the start of the finale to make you think he's a contender. It's a very charitable reading of his game. Eddie. A target since day one has charmed his way through the game. I vote for you in the top three. Yeah. I like I, you. I Will it be enough? Yeah, so charming you cut him off mid-sentence. Got nothing else for ya. If you like this as much as Aubrey liked Coleslaw, like and subscribe, and I'll get you more Survivor content just like this. Until next time, don't get idled out.